Brian Fry. I'm going to be moderating uh, this AI and ethics panel. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about where we're at in society right now. We've got a whole bunch of existential threats. Climate change is one of them. Um, this town and most of the major cities in the world are likely to lose their most valuable real estate by just going underwater. We've got uh, authoritarianism on the rise in the United States and unfortunately many other countries in the world. Um, although there, there are is a, a bunch of statistics about a decrease in violence in the world, we happen to have more war refugees than ever in the history of the world right now, thanks to Syria and Venezuela and there's a whole ton of them in Africa. Um, but that's not the end of the threats. Sort of the not quite so new kid on the block in threats is artificial intelligence. Uh, it has great promise, but it's got uh, some potential downsides, as all technologies that are both powerful and versatile. Okay, so uh, the format of this hour is we're going to have introductions of each of you guys, and mostly you're going to introduce yourselves um, for a couple minutes each. Uh, then I'm going to ask you a few questions. Then you're going to ask them a few questions. And finally, we're going to uh, have some, some like a 30 second or a minute, you know, what you guys want to leave the, uh, the audience with. Uh, as one of our speakers said today, what said last is really important in a presentation. First, I'm going to introduce myself. So I've worked in and around MIT for most of my career. I started working on teaching computers how to improvise jazz. So that's particularly relevant to this conference is it's the art in artificial intelligence. I moved on to do a lot of uh, computer programming, language design and development tools. Um, I've worked at the business school there as well as the media lab and the AI lab, uh, common sense reasoning, um, a lot of uh, user interface stuff. And uh, this semester, I'm teaching a class at MIT called Why Can't We All Just Get Along? About how we can use technology to solve our biggest problems like war and climate change and all that stuff. OK. Uh, next up, um, Kevin Legranger, um, uh, professor at NYIT. So uh, I'm giving, I'm, uh, I'm uh, thanking him for providing this great room. Um, when I was looking up of each of the panelists, I just did a very cursory uh, web search. And so here's what came up for, for Kevin. Um, 2017, he wrote a book called Surviving the Machine Age, Intelligent Technology and the Transformation of Human Work. So this affects all of us. Now, my comment about that title is better or if I had written about that topic, it would have been surviving the exclusively human age and not having to work. <laughs> but I want to say something even more profound about Kevin is he wrote an article um, titled The Disappearing Human-Machine Divide. That just, whoa, <laughs> blew me away. So take it away, Kevin. Hi. I, I can't take credit for providing the room. I think uh, that's a broader group of people than, than include, doesn't include me, really. Um, I'm Kevin Legrander. I'm a professor here at NYIT. I specialize in um, technology and culture and education. So that's a pretty broad uh, venue. Lately, um, I've been focusing my writing and research on AI and ethics and also on um, uh, intelligent technology and education. In particular, I'm, I'm working with John Misek, um, who's here and will be talking about our project later, on, um, on a VR project that is for uh, helping students understand Hamlet. I'm also a, a fellow of an, a think tank called the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. Um, and uh, as Chris said, I've, I've um, uh, recently published a book on, on intelligent technology and the job world, also a book on um, intelligent tech, the history of AI, all the way back to Aristotle, believe it or not. He, he actually thinks about, um, talks about this in his politics, um, of, of the, about the idea of having liars that could play themselves or weaving looms that could anticipate what the master wanted and weave by themselves so that slaves wouldn't be necessary. But we just got a different kind of slave now, um, automatic one. 
So um, that's the general kind of thing I do, uh, and I'm going to pass the baton to the next person. Okay, we'll pass it two over, because I actually want to go to uh, Chris Schrenk first. Um, he works at Amazon. Now, I think of Amazon as a place where I get books, but actually, there's a lot more deeper stuff going on in Amazon. That became no more apparent than when I looked at your web page, and I saw the quote on there, the, the top quote on the web page, teaching machines the difference between right and wrong. Okay. I have two things to say about that mission statement. One is, it's incredibly difficult. So it's extremely hard to do this job. And, and so that, for that, I want to commend your bravery for making a statement like that. Because in AI, you know, an academic institution, you get attacked for doing a lot of things, and that's a pretty outlandish goal. But there's something even more important than that, because I'm around people who, who take big challenges all the time. What's more important is the direction of that challenge and how important it is to civilization. So my name is Chris Screenack, and I'm really happy to be on this panel. Um, I'd like everyone to think for a moment about 2054, OK? That's 35 years from now. And so why that year? Um, when 1984 was written, it was 1949, so it's 35 years out. You probably all think you'll be alive at that time. And right now, when we use the word artificial intelligence, the term artificial intelligence, what we really have is a reflection of the artists and writers and movie makers and influencers who preceded us that gave us an idea of what that expression means. Um, the reality is really quite different. Um, but artists play an essential role in what life is going to be like in 2054. I think of the movie Her, uh, Spike Jones' uh, movie, right, which showed L.A. as a clean city with public transportation and generally happy people. There was a relationship between a man and, and uh, a machine that was having an affair with 350 other men. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is the kind of uh, thinking that artists and musicians uh, bring to society in general. Really, I don't think anybody is more important in the future of AI than artists. I remember my first experience with a computer was with a Commodore 64. And this is, this is a reflection of how old I am. Um, and you know, I got it as a gift. I guess my mom thought it would make me smarter. And the first thing I did, it's funny to reflect on what people's reaction is to technology. I started making music with it. I figured out a little bit of Visual Basic and how it made boops and beeps and just immediately started mus making music. That was my reaction to the exposure of that technology. So I hope that uh, with some of the inspirational presentations we saw this morning and with the purpose and the mission of uh, uh, conferences like this, that you take that same approach to really bring out the beauty uh, that the future can hold. Uh, I'll just say one more thing. Um, I've been in software for more than 40 years, and I just think the state of software today is more imprisoning than it's ever going to be. Uh, working with large mm -hmm. banks and insurance companies and oil and energy and gas, even media and entertainment, um, it could take months to upgrade simple pieces of software. It's a, so ossified, so rigid. Uh, with Machine learning, data writes code. And you'll often hear and, and see in my writings, data writes code. That is the innovation. And because data can update these models very, very frequently, the well-curated feeding of good data to these models can uh, immediately create software benefits for all of us. So I'm really happy to be here and share my thoughts. OK, yeah. Uh, I just want to say something about the movie Her. That is one of the most one of my most favorite movies. So I don't recommend that you see the movie here, her. I recommend that you listen to the movie, her. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Next up, uh, Shweta Jane. Um, she is particularly relevant to what's happening in the news media and journalism today. That's why she's on this panel. And it's a, she's got some fascinating technology to reveal. Should I start with that? Well, uh, <laughs> we're going to ask you some more questions about that technology, but you can talk about whatever you like right now. Sure. 
Um, so my name is Shweta. I'm um, uh, at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm associate professor there. And recently, um, I founded a company called eWitness, which is what we're going to talk about later. But in a nutshell, it's a company that allows people to store the provenance, origin, authenticity of media that they take on cameras or even on a content management system. What it does for the audience is anybody who sees these, this media being shared around, they can cross-check to see where they came from, are they original, or ha have they been manipulated to change the information on them. Okay, we're going to hear more about that, that stuff later. Um, next up is uh, Susan Epstein. She's uh, at Hunter College. Um, what struck me uh, when looking up her was a 2011 book that she edited called Meta Reasoning, Thinking About Thinking. Okay, I can't think of a more fascinating topic than that. Um, She's done uh, a lot of knowledge representation in her work, and knowledge representation is an underappreciated aspect of AI. It's kind of an old, AI, uh, old technology in AI, AI at this point, but uh, very relevant for both uh, humans and machines. Um, I like the fact that you've been involved in linguistics and uh, constraint satisfaction and multiple representations of things which help us in the art world to understand things as well as harder stuff. So, uh, oh, also, uh, both you and her went to Rutgers. So I went to high school across the river from Rutgers because my dad taught at the Graduate School of Education there. And I thought for most of my life I wasn't following in my dad's footsteps, but now I'm teaching at a university. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm not just teaching humans, I'm teaching computers too. And, and oh, I, I should say my night job, which is really the most important job for a programmer, is working at, at Haddington Dynamics, um, where we, uh, we make the robot Dexter. You'll see one around here somewhere. And, I try to make that easy to go. Uh, OK, well, I don't know. Sorry, I took <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Epstein. Um, I'm a professor of computer science at Hunter College. And I get my PhD students from the Graduate Center. I have one, as a matter of fact, who just graduated and will be starting at Amazon Robotics next week. So <laughs> we're sending you our best. Um, my research is supported by the National Science Foundation. That's your tax dollar at work. Uh, and what I'm really interested in, for my whole life pretty much, is how to be really good at solving problems. People aren't born that way. We develop. And I'm interested in machines that develop to do that task. Um, as a result of this, I'm a co-PI on the NSF Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, which is based at Harvard and MIT. Uh, that is an effort, an interdisciplinary effort, on cognitive computational neuroscience. That's quite a combination of words. It's your brain, your mind, and a machine all working together. Uh, through the bounty of NSF, I also have a couple of robots. This is Apollo and Rosie. Rosie's the little one. Uh, they do really fun stuff. They, Rosie lives mostly in simulation, but to give you an idea, uh, the other day, Rosie and a bunch of people, again, in simulation, came out of an elevator. The people all went to the right, and Rosie went to the left. My st student paused the movement of the robot and said, why are you going that way? And Rosie said, your way might be shorter, but mine is going to be a lot less crowded. All right. <laughs> you like that? That's for real, and that's coming from her. OK, so let's see how we get there. In order to get there, um, I have to tell you what AI is. That's my job this morning. And in order to do that, I have to tell you first what a computational agent is. Ready? OK. So a computational agent lives in a perpetual sense, decide, act loop. You can do that too. Hold really still, sense the world, make a decision about what you're going to do next, and then act. All right? Sense, decide, act. You are surrounded by machines like this all the time. Here's an example. Anybody recognize that? Yeah, it's a thermostat, right. 
it senses the temperature in the room, it decides whether or not to turn the air conditioner on or off, and then it does that. Or maybe it's running the heater. Whichever one it is, that's all a computational agent does. Sense, decide, and act. Now, that may, ability to make a decision based on what you perceive about the world and what you're able to do, this machine, this particular machine can only turn things on, one thing on and off, those things make for a computational agent but they sure don't make it smart. You don't walk by your thermostat and say, what a brilliant device, okay? So let's push this a little bit now. Artificial intelligence simulates, in I'm gonna do that again, backwards, there is a backwards here. Come on, backwards, okay. Artificial intelligence simulates intelligent human behavior with a computational agent. Well, you all know what a computational agent is. Let's look at those blue words. Let's start with simulate. Simulate as opposed to emulate. If I emulate an intelligent behavior, I have to build an electrochemical soup just like what's inside your head. That's your brain. It lives there. No one on this platform is building an electrochemical soup. We can't do that yet. We don't know enough. Just first start. So that's why we're simulating it. We're building those black boxes we heard about earlier today that look uh, you can't see inside, it's not transparent, that's the other word we use, but they do what we would think of as intelligent. All right, so then there's that other word there, human, that's blue too. And the reason for that is if tomorrow a rocket ship lands on Columbus Circle and out come these little green creatures and they're much smarter than we are, I'm done looking at people. Got it? I w I'm interested in smart, and s people for now are s the smartest thing I can find. So that's what AI is trying to do, that sense, decide, act loop, but I want a smart computational agent. Anybody know what that picture is? It's a, it, they bought, Google bought them about three years ago. It's a thermostat company called Nest. What Nest does is it watches you in your room it knows when you come home, it knows what temperature you like, it, you can control it with your smartphone. It will learn when to turn the heat on or off or up or down. Magic? No, it's not really magic, Mr. White. It's uh, an AI. It's an artificially intelligent agent. Okay? So now let's get to the hard questions. What is this process? What is this chore that we're all involved in or delight, depending on how you look at it? What's it all about? Well, we're asking a lot of hard questions. We want to know how the human brain works. That was where I started when I was in grad school. I, my, the first time I met a neurologist, I sat down and I said, tell me everything you know about how the brain works so I can make a machine do that. And he just looked at me. And then he said, I wish I knew. All right? So if we don't exactly know, we know more every week. Um, but even if we did know how exactly a human brain worked, the next question is, do we want a machine to work like way? Maybe not. Um, how does a human behave? Ah, now we talk to the psychologists, right? How do they behave? We can, psychologists are brilliant at devising experiments to find out the answer to that question. But then the next question becomes, just because we know how a human behaves, do we want a machine to behave like that? For example, the first robot arm that was invented, there was a guy playing with it in his lab, and one of his friends walked by, and he invited his friend in to come see his new robot arm. Now this is like 1970s maybe, long time ago. And the second person who came in was an engineer. The first person was a roboticist or an early roboticist. The engineer looked at the magical robot arm and watched the wrist and said, why does the wrist turn that way? And the roboticist very proudly said, because mine turns like this. And the engineer said, my goodness, it could turn 360 degrees and continue to rotate in either direction. It's not a human wrist. Why would you want to do that? There you go. So that's the, just because a person does it, why should a machine? Um, and then the next question is, how do you describe the world to an agent? That's that knowledge representation stuff. We have, we're multi-sensory. We can smell and touch and feel and hear. Um, but poor little computers can't do that. Even if I make them robots, you know, put a computer in a robot, 
that's not going to help a lot. They don't see the world the way we do. And I am not about to go out and label every human and piece of furniture an object in the world with a barcode so that the robot can figure out what it's looking at. Okay. And then the last question is, how can an agent change its behavior based on its experience? Uh, it's a wonderful picture. <laughs> I love that picture. I use it on all my slides. And that's what machine learning is. It's the transformation of the behavior of an intelligent agent based on what it's experienced. OK, thanks for that two-minute introduction. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna declare uh, victory on that question of what is AI. Thank you. That was a real tutorial that uh, better than what we usually get at MIT. Uh, next, I'm gonna give perhaps our toughest question: Is capitalism compatible with AI? To Chris, because as I said, he's a brave guy. Is capitalism compatible with AI? So economics, uh, of course, is a social science, and it was, it's really developed to help us all live better lives and, and use it in our politics, in our finance every day. There's an economic expression I'd like to just very quickly describe. It's called complements and substitutes. So uh, imagine um, tomorrow that a cup of coffee at Starbucks goes from $2 to 20 cents. Uh, what's going to happen to the price of things around it, right? Well. Uh, the complements of coffee are cream and sugar. And because the cost went down so dramatically, the demand will go up for cream and sugar, and suddenly uh, the cream and sugar are going to be a lot more valuable. What's a substitute for coffee? That's tea, right? So uh, tea would have to come down in price because of that effect, right? So we're experiencing this right now with machine learning. Uh, due to some advances in software and hardware, predictions, which are the fruit of machine learning, have become really inexpensive. In fact, what I tell a lot of folks is when you're at an AI conference or somebody's trying to sell you something that's in AI, whenever you hear AI, rep replace the expression AI with cheap predictions and see if it still makes sense because that's really what it is, right? So the history of economics is the history of capital and technology. And we should be looking at it and, and taking its models and metaphors to help improve our lives. That's the whole point, right? And mm -hmm. from Adam Smith's early days, you know, as, as he began to look at the market, uh, we began to use that word market. So if you turn on the news tomorrow, and there's an economist or someone on uh, a news a finance channel, they're going to talk about the market as if it's a thing. <laughs> but it's not a thing. It's, it's a model. It's a model that helps us think about the world, and, and it's helpful. And um, there's an expression that says that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, so, uh, you know, machine learning has the potential to greatly, dramatically elevate the quality of life on, on, on this planet. There's no question. Um, and, you know, we know that there are harmful agents uh, in society as well. And I spend a lot of time working with cybersecurity agents, you know, who are doing just that, making sure that these things, you know, don't. Uh, have the ill effects that, that we want. So um, I guess I'm saying a, a long way of saying that I think it's entirely uh, compatible. It almost doesn't make sense because capital and technology is the basis of, of economics and capitalism is a model that we created to help us think about that. I'm going to push back on that. Okay. If we, if we have AI, that means we're going to get, I mean, real advanced AI here. We get very clever marketing. We're going to get uh, uh, companies really understanding a lot about you. And imagine some company or maybe even some country gets it first. And if they can use that to accelerate their own development of AI, then they can go very quickly. And I think that will destroy capitalism, actually. Well, it'll, I shouldn't. I should be careful about destroying capitals. It'll it'll destroy the free market because it will be much less free because this overwhelming power of intelligence to control us might uh, do a lot of damage to what we like to think is kind of the give and take. And there's lots of players. But I'm going to push back on your bias. Okay. <laughs> I would agree with that. Um, so there's there's really four things happening right now, um, all at the same time, and and I think we tend to put the label artificial intelligence on them, right? There's clearly automation and robotics. There's CRISPR and the ability to do genetic modifications. 
Um, there's IoT, right? Uh, Raspberry Pi, which uh, is out here in many of the exhibits. Five dollars for a Pi Zero, right? It's very likely that within you know three or four years there will be maybe five or ten or a hundred of these things in every room that you're in, and with they'll be enchanted objects that that think with you and, and coordinate with you. Um, so uh, reflecting back on on what you're saying, the bias that I'm hearing, right, is really coming out of this dystopian future that the artists created because it's fun and it's, it's entertaining. Um, but it's not the reality. Like, uh, there's a great book uh, that I was reading, I, I think it was from uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, um, uh, Siddhartha uh, Medhuji, I believe is his uh, last name, uh, where he's talking about the life of um, uh, King Louis XIV. And, you know, he would have, I think, 30 meals prepared for him every day, and he would choose, and it would be, you know, come from, you know, all around the land. But today, we can walk out on Broadway right now and have a choice of hundreds mm. of different cuisines from around the world and live in uh, inarguably more comfort uh, and more personal satisfaction than, you know, Louis XIV ever could, the Sun King, right? So, um, so these biases have to be addressed. Let me just say one more thing, because there is something that I am concerned about uh, that I do think is real. While we were following this narrative that there's a dystopian future coming from all of these advancements in technology, we've ignored the fact that uh, the machine learning algorithms that serve as free content in exchange for viewing ads is directly affecting the chemistry in our brain. Mm. Now, Jan and Lania wrote a book called 10 Arguments for De Deleting Your Social Media Right Now, whose argument is not that you know, the social media should die, it's that it should be reinvented because we're being actively surveyed constantly. And when we're looking at our feeds, the chemicals in our brains, uh, principally dopamine and cortisol, are driving engagement, which make us continue to want ads, which is the business model behind surveillance-based mm. companies. Now, that's a danger, and I think it's starting to be addressed, and I you know, really give a lot of kudos to Jen and uh, Lanier for bringing that finally into the discussion. But you know, I, uh, one other thing that he says in that is, you know, it's behavior modification, working with cortisol and dopamine, and when B.F. Skinner introduced that in the 60s, he was talking about the experience in, of caged animals. But right now, every one of you is carrying the cage around with you <laughs> all the time. We wake up with it in the morning. It's the first thing we look at, and we go to sleep with it at night. Sometimes it lulls us to our sleep. Sometimes it guides our meditations. Yeah. So this is something that I, I think is something. But you know, simply bringing the awareness up is clearly the first step. And there's creative minds all over the world. Now, I could go on, so I'll just stop right there. Take it away, Kevin. I'm well, sure uh, you're... <laughs> well, I actually agree with Chris on almost everything he said. I think um, tech addiction, what, what you're talking about, is, is a big problem. I have a, friend, I have a friend in Indiana who is always on Facebook. He's very guilty of, of TMI, you know, too much, too much information. He's always sharing, like, the first 10 things I see on my Facebook feed are all his. Um, and it's because he likes that shot of dopamine um, when he opens up and sees people liking his stuff. Um, that's why I think um, uh, we need to be careful in our development of AI, and uh, that's where I would head next uh, to, to add on to what you said, is that AI has a lot of benefits, a lot of potential benefits for society. It can make, I agree with you, it can make capitalism um, and the marketing, market experience more efficient and actually better for people, um, and for corporations too. But I think it, I think it can, there are also a lot of big dangers um, in how it's used. For instance, the two big examples that come up all the time in ethics are uh, killer robots, um, that is uh, lethal autonomous weapons, uh, machine guns that can target and fire and kill people um, without human intervention. And then the other one is, is um, you know, just jobs. Um, people are being put out of jobs by, uh, by automation. So I think I think we need to be careful in, uh, in how we develop it. And I think regulation is a really prob a problematic thing. It's, it's sort of a two-headed monster, right? In the one hand, regulation can work really well, <clears throat> or pretty well, as it has uh, with nuclear weapons. I mean, we haven't blown ourselves up yet. Um, 50 years after, or 75 years after World War II, we haven't used another atomic weapon. That's good. However, as we all know from watching how 
nuclear weapons are regulated, it's very difficult to police that. And it's even harder with AI, because AI doesn't take as big, uh, big a complex of, of resources um, that can be easily choked off. So I think that the, the thing to do is not to regulate, because that's always post hoc anyway. You wait for a disaster, then you go, oh, we should regulate that. Um, instead, coming up with precepts, I think, is important for how we develop AI. And so a lot of computer scientists and other people uh, in industry as well are trying to come up with certain basic general precepts for how to proceed. And um, there's a really good example of that called the Montreal Declaration that was only um, brought into existence a couple months ago in December 4th of this past year uh, at a meeting in Montreal at the University of Montreal. A bunch of computer scientists and people from other disciplines as well uh, worked hard devising just six simple precepts. I'll read the first two. They're very uh, short. The first two, for example, are the development and use of artificial intelligence systems must permit the growth of the well-being of all sentient beings. Very broad concept and, um, and you know, friendly to AI and friendly to humanity. The second one is privacy and intimacy must be protected from AIS intrusion and data acquisition and archiving systems. So data is the heart of what we do with machine learning now. But how that data is gathered and saved is really important and not being attended to, I don't think, very carefully at the moment. <clears throat> so that's where I would head with uh, an add-on to what Chris said. Yeah, just one more point on that one. Um, you know, I talked about compliments and substitutes. The number one complement of inexpensive predictions is human judgment. The value of human judgment and how we're going to use it when we use these tools is higher than ever. Frankly, anyone who has it that's working in marketing or operations, et cetera, um, is, gonna, is underpaid right now. The problem is we don't have enough of it. Uh, the technicians I work with every day understand AI. They know machine learning. You know, we always say uh, AI is in, uh, if it's in PowerPoint, it's AI. If it's in Python, it's machine learning, right? So <laughs> they already know it, but the executives really need to understand it and, uh, and embody what you're saying because uh, you know, if you're saying, well, all right, so I always like to say, who, who's ever received a message that says, um, I have a 98, I, I got, there's a 98% probability that you have new mail, right? Nobody. But because predictions are the basis of AI, uh, an engineer can make a, you know, a judgment and say, well, this will be refined later, that 95% is enough, or 85% is enough. And this thing gets replicated as software and, and uh, hardware does, and then it's out there in the market, but 85% wasn't enough. You really needed to be in the high 90s. And that's where these damages can really begin to come in. So the people in the creative arts, like I said, it's really the artists where, where it begins. I mean, just like every neighborhood that gets gentrified, right? The artists come in first um, to really raise the, the level, the standard of judgment that um, everyone's using to use these tools. How about, yeah, I want to get some other opinions in, in here. In defense of the practitioner, um, I have a couple things to say. You all have, I presume, very smart phones in your pockets somewhere. Uh, every time you find something <laughs> wonderful and delightful that you got for free on your phone, you didn't get it for free. Keep that in mind. You're giving them data in exchange. You're sharing your location. You're sharing what it is you prefer, what you like, how much you like it. So you're creating the data that these machines are going to learn on. If you don't give them the data, they, don't, they won't know enough about you so that they can sell you their products or make their predictions. That's part one. And the data is what you see in here. It's not just lines. And Absolutely. It's where you are, where you go, what you experience they're seeing in the background if they're looking at you with a camera. Um, okay, so that's part one. Part two is April 8th, 2019, the EU issued a, a very long document, which is an attempt to legis not legislate so much as define what it is that it believes are the dangers and opportunities in AI. In there are, I, can't, I didn't count, someone else did, 131 rules. These rules are questions, only questions, that executive officers of companies, all the way down to regular human beings, and in between, the people we're all overlooking here, the programmers. And so I teach AI and machine learning, 
And I actually spent an hour and a half the other day explaining to a young group of seniors about to go out in the world who claim they know AI, uh, what it is they have to think about when they write code. How they would think about which way a car turns if it has to avoid an accident. The old trolley problem, yeah? Okay, there's one person that way, there are five people that way, and the trolley's got two tracks, and you're standing there with the switch, and you have no brake. The trolley has no brakes, and you have to do something. And now how do you choose? That's something that's easy to think about. If you touch that switch at all, you're culpable in some way for killing either one person or five, all right? Now you go out and buy an automated car five, ten years from now that'll drive for you. Be sure you ask them what algorithm is driving that car and making those choices. You wouldn't want to buy a car that was going to make decisions for you if you didn't know what those decisions were. And the people who write the code for those cars are the ones you really have to wonder about. And there's a cultural bias to that question as well, the trolley question, which is, we talk about this in my class all the time, which is um, the cultural bias of the ethical system that you're using to base the algorithm on. For instance, te uh, questionnaires given in different countries have people killing different people with that trolley, depending on which culture they're from. If there's a young person on one side and an old woman on the other, the Americans all kill the old woman, the Japanese kill the baby. Um, for cultural reasons of how old people are viewed in different cultures. So that, that kind of, these questions about ethics and AI are really complicated and um, not really resolved yet. I think, I, I don't see how we're gonna make an AI system for, of ethics for a car, for instance. Um, how, to, how it's gonna make a decision about whom to kill in an accident. I think that's But it is tough. gonna make that decision whether or not we see how it's going to do it. If it gets sold, it will be making that decision. If it gets sold, I think, is the question. <laughs> well, you're going to have a lot of trucks on the road very soon. Not, not cars, but trucks that are doing long haul that are going to be making decisions. There's no doubt about that. Do you think that the government, our government and, and regulators will allow that to happen without a good, without a good ethical system built into the truck, because right now it's still up in the air as far as I know. California has licensed 30 some odd companies to test self-driving cars without intervention on the road right now. Yeah, it's coming to a theater near you. <laughs> if you wanna go, well, you can talk we, about we this. We talk want. about uh, the ethics in AI, but there is ethics, uh, ethics in every new technology that comes in. Mm. When the internet came, people thought, oh, it's internet. There was no security back then in the internet, mm -hmm. right? So the government didn't control that until people started losing their credit card information. Mm -hmm. No, but the government had DARPA. I'm old enough, so I was on the DARPA net, okay? I was a grad student, and that was tightly controlled. It belonged to the defense agency, and you couldn't get away with anything there. It was when we turned around and opened it up. Exactly. Yes. OK. Um, I want to make a comment about this trolley problem and this stuff about transportation. I know a lot about transportation. When you have a decision where you have this dichotomy of, will you do this thing? We're going to get screwed over here, but if we do this, we're going to kill these old people over here. Often, you're in a false dichotomy. You want to have a different solution that can transcend the problems of either one of those. In transportation, cars are just a mediocre idea from 100 years ago, and we need to get rid of both cars and trucks. <laughs> and you can talk to me later about you know, different technologies. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna move into, uh, that was kind of like a larger, bigger picture conceptual ethics stuff, and we wanna move into more of a locally, uh, time locally, what's happening in, in politics right now. So, we have a President of the United States who just a few weeks ago told his 10,000th verifiable lie to the American public. And uh, in the na last week, the Speaker of the House said that the Attorney General lied to Congress, okay? Well, relevant on um, how we're getting the truth in this, uh, what some people have called the post-truth era, 
Um, uh, Shweta has some new uh, innovations on how we can deal with social media, like you know what's happening on Facebook. It's, it's getting a lot of press um, right now, and uh, perhaps other um, areas in uh, Twitter, and you know you can imagine our whole communication uh, universe out there. But I had a I had a sort of an alternative uh, uh, way to phrase this question, which is AI, fake news, and democracy. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Take it away. So I'm going to scoot away from the politics. I don't want to get into that at the beginning launch of eWitness. Um, however, that was the motivation. Um, so eWitness was a project sponsored by National Science Foundation, again, your tax dollars. Um, and we were initially looking at how to find whether uh, a media, a piece of media on a phone is, uh, is forensically sound, meaning it has the right location and the time, and it's, it's an evidence that a police officer can trust and can present it in court. And then came the deep fake era where everything can be denied or everything can be created. Um, so, so first of all, everything can be created and that's why things can be denied. I, I didn't do that, that's fake. Um, the plausible deniability. Um, with that inspiration, uh, we have, uh, what, what we are doing is if we cannot tell whether something was a deep fake or not, but we can tell what is true. So if there is a picture um, or a video that was indeed taken from a camera, we can pr uh, create a fingerprint, a hash of that asset and place it on a blockchain. And why blockchain? Because this is, treat this as an item in a supply chain just like a food or a medicine on a supply chain. We want to track where it came from, where it went, and how it was propagated around. And so this picture or video taken on your phone has a fingerprint on the blockchain. Now you share it wherever you want. And nobody can tell, nobody can say it's a fake because you have a proof of its origin. They can cross verify it. They can freely share it on Twitter. It has the permission to go viral because it is the truth. Um, compare that with something that was created uh, with a face swap or some, or some other modifications. Um, and that comes on your Twitter feed. You can cross check it and say that this is not verified by eWitness. So it's possible it's not true. I'm, I'm going to wait and see if it is, it is uh, busted by a news agency or not, and, and then I'll share it. I won't share it immediately. So it, it, the e-witness is, is a product which helps people verify something as a true media or not. And so that has repercussions in politics, even Absolutely. though I said I'll scoot away from and it. And science. And science, yeah. So there, it, has, it has a huge impact on journalism. Um, there are a lot of small journalist uh, j uh, freelancers and small newspapers that are coming up who need the credibility, who want to be uh, known as uh, the pioneers of truth. And they benefit from having something like eWitness as uh, in their platform. Um, I was speaking to a major news, a news agency earlier this week, and they are willing to put millions of pictures on e-witness once it comes up, yes. so that there is a proof that this is where it came from. Are you going to comment, Chris, or I don't know? Oh, <laughs> uh, just intellectual property rights for artists as well, which is uh, already uh, a thing everyone should know about. Um, there was a recent machine learning paper that uh, explored why fake news travels so much more broadly. And in an attempt, it, it, the science on it is beautiful. I, we read it in my lab this week. Um, the demonstration was that you can't blame this on the robots, which people, you know, there are these, th there are these robotic, they're not really robots, but they're computers that put out news and then propagated on Twitter. This was all based on tweets, millions and millions of tweets in the last 15 years. And these people all work for the people who control the tweets, so this mm -hmm. is cool. They have data we don't. Uh, it turns out it's not the fake robots spreading the news. 
uh, the real robots spreading fake news. And it's not the shape of the way that the news travels. It is the human beings. And that people retweet fake news more quickly than they retweet the truth. Whoa. And Oops. the numbers are, they're blindingly, they're blindingly high. It, there's wow. no doubt. So again, it's your responsibility too. If you're gonna share, be sure you believe in what you're sharing, that it is true. Or put a note on it that says maybe. So the reason why fake news travels faster is because fake news happens to be more provocative more sensational, uh, yes. and that's why people share it. And therefore, it's very important for people to know a single click verification that this, is, this might not be true. Cortisol and dopamine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to um, move into the audience Q&A section uh, of the panel. And we do have, uh, looks like we have somebody already up at the mic. A cue? A statement and a, and a cue. OK. Um, on the note of the propagation of fake news, uh, I, I mean, it's go it has been going on forever. Uh, but specifically on Twitter, I have a paper that was funded by NSF called Keeping Up with the Tweet Dashians, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which shows the propag propagation of news in j of, um, it, it was made to, the model is for um, checking uh, misinformation during crisis situations. Uh, and so then that has now been applied to fake news. So if you want information on how tweets are propagated and want to go down that rabbit hole, keeping up the tweet dashians. Um, so my, my question is, um, you mentioned bias, not reality, um, and how we get the truth, uh, how uh, we ignore that free content is not free. Um, and those are all the terrible things that the general population thinks about, right? Uh, they receive dystopian information through um, books, through comics, through all form of media that's consumed. Um, and so we talked a lot about today about the possibilities. How do we get the general population to want to get the truth, to get them on board and see the good possibilities that we talked about here today? Great question. How do I get people to want to know the truth? I think everybody wants to know the truth. Or they think they and, they th and, and they think what they're seeing is true. But it isn't because now people need to know that uh, there, are, there is a lot of technology out there, very accessible, and people can modify things very easily. And as we raise the awareness among people about this, they will understand and then they will seek better measures um, and they will try to research things before they forward them. I happen to think you're a little too optimistic there. I have a cynical view that the great bulk of people want confirmation, not information. And Agreed. that causes, the problem is us, really. Um, but I think your innovation would be great because it, it takes the place of all those fact-checking organizations that nobody wants to check because they want confirmation and they get that on the, uh, you know, sensationalistic uh, posts, so. Um, I'm gonna give the optimist view. Um, <laughs> there was a time not long ago when everybody smoked cigarettes. Uh, doctors even mm. recommended cigarette brands. Now clearly culture has changed, right? So I still have an Instagram account. I mean, I'm still on uh, social media. Um, so, you know, even though I advocate, uh, we should protest against the network effect, you know, the, start swimming out of that tank. It's so that this software will improve when we begin to break the network effect, because that's what's got us locked into surveillance media. Um, that's when the change will come. But it begins with us being aware. Why am I on the phone right now? Why am I clicking? Why am I forwarding this? Is it confirmation bias? Do I, you know, do I want to propagate my own views? And is that, do I feel a little high when I'm doing that? And that's a, a subtle awareness that we can all begin to uh, simply uh, notice? Facebook just polled their uh, users to see if they could take down the like-dislike. Mm -hmm. And the users were 80-something percent against removing that. They like their dopamine. Yes, they do. So again, it all comes back <laughs> to us as humans. Don't blame the machines. OK, next, next comment or question, please. 
Um, hi, first of all, uh, I've heard panels on different topics before. This, the structure of this panel in general has been quite good, thank you. Um, right. I do want to question that idea about putting a video on blockchain as being to verify truth. Um, first of all, the idea, I think that's overly simplistic, at least the way it was commented on. Uh, for instance, if there's a sports event and you want to know if a player in basketball fouled another one, often they show that uh, physical activity from the several different video angles. And depending on which video you see could suggest a different truth. And putting it on blockchain is not going to make that event true. There's also the idea of the quality of the video. Not all video has the same quality. And I would also share with you that there, from my recollection, there's been a law professor, probably more than one, who has done an experiment with their law class where they had some people come in to the front of the room, have some sort of scuffle, and leave. And then the law professor proceeded to ask them what happened. And different students said different things. Again, it could suggest the angle from which they were sitting. And so I would just be very careful about thinking that a video put on blockchain would be of high quality. Uh, Shweta, can you speak to that? I think there's a clarification issue. Yes, there's a clarification issue. The video is actually not on the blockchain. It's a, it's a hash which says that the footage that you're looking at was not modified. It's not, it's not modified or forged. So you have the videos of the football player from different angles. Uh -huh. Each one of, of the footage is, is hashed. The fingerprint, it's a 256-bit random number, which basically tells that this video is what it was. It's the truth from of that the angle. video. From that angle. From and that angle. This is the video, and with, it wasn't modified. With that quality. And yes. Okay. Yes. I kind of, I think I very much liked Susan's comment about if you go and send something out to someone else, uh, that you might add, maybe. <laughs> uh, let, let me just explain a, a little further. I think there's a, a mis misunderstanding that's forming here. Uh, the E-Witness e e is verifying the, the origin of the video, so that if you took a video uh, of your sister dancing, and then I got my hands on it, and I gave her a beard, and then I put it out and I said, look, her sister has a beard. My video is fake, but your video was real. Do you understand? So yours would be verified as like, you're the original one. Mine would not be, because I've altered it. So uh, all it's not saying this happened or that happened. All eWitness is doing is saying, this is the original video that hasn't been tampered with. It's like a tamper-proof seal on the top of the aspirin bottle. It's, it's pretty much that, yes. This is where your aspirin bottle came from. This truck carried it. This pharmacy it was sold at. And no one opened and it. And no one opened it. There you go. Yes, it, you got it? Yes, but again, if there's only one video of an event out there, and yes, it's verified that it hasn't been tampered with, there's still room for there to be a misinterpretation of an event. And that's Absolutely. why we have courts. That's why we have law and judges and jury and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have time for one more question. Hi. I want to go back to the, um, I guess, the, the Twitter bot thing we were talking about before. Uh, since it's a, a huge challenge for us in 2016 and is going to be even bigger in 2020. Um, since Facebook or Twitter, they don't really have the financial incentive to solve this problem themselves. They essentially, m the more fake news there is and the more sort of um, fake accounts there are, the more money they make. So I, I, it's hard for me to believe that they can really police them, even if we could develop technology, even if they really could develop the technology to identify what was fake. It's just not in their interest to do it. And so what's our, um, 
does that mean we're locked into Trump forever, or do we have to? Is it, you know is there any solution? Do we have to say the government can come in and regulate speech on these platforms and say you're not allowed to? Uh, we're going to have some sort of rules on what's uh, on what's true and stuff like that. I mean, uh, wh where where do we go with this? You know, if you don't mind, I'd like to address that by saying I like to drink. <laughs> and, and I know that alcohol is bad for me. Um, so I try to do it in moderation, and, and I'm aware that drinking is bad for me. Um, and that has evolved culturally. That wasn't my original thought. Like, well, it probably was the first time I had a drink. Ooh, this doesn't taste good. Um, but I really think it has to come from us. We can talk about regulation, but I think I think uh, Zuckerberg already confirmed in his um, uh, Congress congressional hearings that regulation is only going to help his business. That's true, of course. I mean, if you're hoping for humanity to change and develop a better nature within the next you year. Smoke cigarettes? We can give you algorithms that'll probably help. Uh, that's what, uh, there are at least half a dozen places you can go on the web and do your own fact checking. Nobody wants to bother, right? Um, and I don't think the courts are going to support it either because there was an absolutely brilliant algorithm to detect gerrymandering and the Supreme Court just essentially tossed the case out, I think genuinely because they didn't understand the algorithm. The algorithm was dead on, it was really clean, it was totally objective, it demonstrated ger gerrymandering and it was opaque, the court couldn't understand it. So part of our obligation in AI is to be able to explain what we're doing if we're a machine. Forgive me for anthropomorphizing. Excellent. Okay, so um, there's this big push for explainable AI. That's why Rosie said that she wants to turn left when everybody else is going right. She could have just done it, but that's not gonna be a machine I'm gonna wanna live with, and we are all gonna live with a lot of machines. So let's get machines that if at least they don't do exactly what you would like, will at least explain to us what they're doing. I think we want to keep going with questions because I'm kind of into this, so let's take another one since you've been waiting. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm actually extremely curious about um, the, the verification process and I'm curious to know, is the technology meant to um, only, almost serve as like a seal of uh, kind of like the aspirin bottle metaphor for future like new assets or what's the intention for retrofitting it to assets that's like created in the past how do we decipher like you know fabricated fake news and from from you know the, the span of history and just because oftentimes in any sort of context any sort of medium journalism you get mixtures of contents that's from present day generated and also archival in, um, content as well. Right, so um, we are trying to track the origin of media, mm -hmm. right? We can obviously do it for future media by retrofitting things in uh, the, the, the application on cameras. Um, there is an app on Android's uh, Google Play Store, which you can download for your future pictures. But let's look at, a, look at trusted sources of pictures, other trusted sources of pictures. For example, archives um, that, that are maintained in uh, news organizations, um, police departments, courts, any, any evidence that is already there and we, we trust them. We know that the moon landing happened. So, um, uh, some people don't. <laughs> so, uh, the, the pictures of uh, th those nature, they, they're coming from a trusted source already. Mm -hmm. And so those archival pictures, since they are a trusted source, they can also be placed on the blockchain um, with, with the provenance that this was archived and then it was posted at this point and have a notation of uh, what it is and where it comes from. So yes, there is, there is a possibility to put artwork as well over there. Mm -hmm. so, but then all it needs to say is this was an artwork by an artist whose name is so-and-so and they made it. And now you can think of a next application where the artist can actually get paid every time the, uh, the art is used. Uh, Eric? I just, have a, well, I just have a question about the trolley problem, because it's talked about a lot in this kind of context. So the, the trolley problem from a, philosophy, from a philosophy perspective was meant to get at this idea of intention, right? Like, 
what you know you're at the lever you have a clear choice ahead of you and what is your intention to do and that's how we evaluate the morality of your action but the the car example um, it doesn't strike me to be the same thing because this car it you know it's like if you're driving at the wheel the kind of the trolley problem doesn't really translate because so no um, because it, everything is happening so fast, and you don't really have the um, you don't really have the time or the uh, availability to have an intention at that at that speed, right? So, isn't this is this not the same with the with the car? Like, do we really care about what the in, like? Will there ever be an intention in this problem that somebody has to program in, or is things just going to happen so quickly that it would just be the same of a human driver? In that situation, where like you did, you move to turn you know left to kill one person or right to kill five people, and the person's just going to say, I, "I don't know, I just I just turned." Uh, but <laughs> yeah, this because now you're getting into human intention uh, intentionality versus machine machines, because that's really the crux of your question. So I mean, your assumption is that humans don't make decisions that are split second, whereas neurological science shows that they do. Uh, in fact, a lot, a lot of your decisions are made before you even take action um, by what's called the um, cognitive unconscious by some people. So you actually make those decisions. If you're, if, you're, if you're driving down the street and there are five people in front of you and your brakes fail and you have a choice of veering off into a wall to keep from killing them, you're making that decision. You're gonna either kill yourself or kill those people. So what are you going to do? You do make those decisions as a driver. It may be very quick, but you still make them. And so how do you? So we have to train AI to do the same thing, which is really your we bailiwick. We code AI to do that. You buy that car if it drives by itself. Those decisions have already been made for you in code. And let me point out that if you think, OK, so I'll never drive a self-driving car, do you have an electric mixer or a food processor in your house that doesn't know your hand from a spoon and will cheerfully chop up either one? Um, you do. <laughs> and, I, and I'd like to thank you for that question, because it perfectly illustrated the complement substitutes thing. I mean, human judgment is going to be used when that software goes from uh, development to production. And we need to elevate our um, choices. And, and everyone, uh, not just technicians, uh, they need to understand the implications of these judgments as consumers as well as producers. One more, uh, last one from Cynthia Gaetan. Hello, um, my question, I went to the US Patent and Trademark Office. There was a conference on the US approach to AI. It was at the end of January, I believe. And I was very concerned you know, being in the audience, and while I'm from Seattle, I really like, you know, having Amazon there, Microsoft there, and <laughs> all that sort of thing. Um, I was very concerned that the the focus of the discussion was on Western data and Western law, um, and there were two continents not represented at all on that panel: Africa and South America. If you want to include Australia. Um, the islands were not represented, and it concerns me, and I don't know if there are any initiatives with regard to this, we're talking about ethics, where the data of folks who are not part of these discussions have input as to their cultural or their proprietary interest in their own data is being collected, but they don't have any representation. And so I was wondering if you all know of any kinds of initiatives, because that was very uh, concerning to me being in the audience and not seeing any representation from two continents. There's an international organization with more than 90 uh, groups in it at this point that are working on AI uh, ethics, very specifically. And I don't know, but I can give you a link to the organization and you can go check. That's the best I can do for you. I do know that every time they get people from multiple con continents in the same room to have this conversation, that everybody recognizes, and my students do too, immediately, that we all have different judgments as to what's moral or right. And we have to figure out how to live with each other in the whole world, let alone on a machine, with those differences. 
I think um, I lied. Um, and Jeff Becker, our fabulous photographer, uh, is going to take a turn at the mic. <laughs> so what happens when I put a photograph in the blockchain, and then I post it to Facebook, and they illegally, in my opinion, strip out the metadata because the copyright law says that they're not allowed to change it because I'm the owner. And then there's no information about who owns that photograph, and I have two photographs, the original and the changed one, but there's no identifying data in my original. How do we cope with that? And the other thing I'd just like to say is that because all of the AI is created by humans, till the computer is smarter than we are, all those decisions are still made by humans. Right. So um, your photographs, you're sharing it on Facebook. Uh, the metadata is already taken down. Uh, Facebook does not keep the metadata. Correct. So. Yeah. So how do we know who, which, now there's two originals, the one that you have, you changed, and my original, who has the original? Um, so since the hash is calculated on the content of the picture, not the metadata alone, uh, okay. we can still track that picture as your picture, even though the metadata is missing. Okay. So we still wow. know that it's yours. Yeah, and in terms of like well, the art world, they found that about 50% of those very expensive paintings the Swiss did are fakes. So the, one, one other so, thing okay. to look into here is uh, blockchain. You know, is a, is, a, is a fundamental concept that's it's, that's happening right now and it's happening before our eyes. Um, there's a a few problems with blockchain, but one of the benefits is smart contracts that can uh, trigger be triggered immediately by violations of things like. Uh, copyright infringement and things like this. Now, you got to shop around for your blockchain, and um, Ashweta's blockchain might not be the right place for your photograph. It might be. I don't know. But I'm, what I'm saying is that this is almost like in 19, what is it, had to be like 93 when there was a big dot com land grab. Everyone had to get the right domain name. That's actually kind of happening right now in blockchain, uh, in all these various vertical markets and everything. So my blockchain is the media blockchain. Uh, there is a standardization organization. Uh, JPEG is leading it. Um, they are meeting at least four times a year to decide on the standard of this media blockchain. And once it's standardized, of course, anybody can put it up. And I'm sure there's going to be one for the artists, one for the journalists, one for police investigators, one for everybody. Yeah. OK. We're going to wrap it up with everybody getting like a minute or maybe even 30 seconds if you're really smart <laughs> of what do you want these people to walk away with? Susan, start with you and let's just go across the I road. never like to order first at the restaurant either. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, machines learn from data and the data comes from you. And the machines are only as smart as their experience and their programmers. Be careful of what you wish for because you will get it. So uh, I want everyone to imagine the perfect positive outcome, uh, especially as you're uh, expressing yourself artistically. And we'll see if we get there. Don't believe anything that you see unless you've verified it. <laughs> Don't panic, but stay vigilant and think about what, what you want to see in your uh, devices. I wish all of you could have come to my MIT course this semester, but you can do the next best thing, which is get my book on <laughs> Amazon <laughs> or uh, the website whycantwe.org. Please join me in thanking our wisdom <laughs> here on the stage. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to all of you.